I'm going to hand it over to Ed, who has promised that tonight's evening will be very fun. So, Ed, <laughs> panelists, Great. I leave well, it to uh, you. Great. Thanks very much, Anthony. And, um, I realize I'm caught between uh, Damien saying this is going to be a glorious and insightful panel uh, and pointing out that I also st we stand in your way between cocktails and canapes uh, later on in the evening. I was the uh, British culture minister. I was the longest serving culture minister in British history because I just kept my head down, uh, avoided being noticed and hung on till the end of the Cameron government. In fact, I was the last minister that Theresa May fired. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, I also uh, do a Times radio show. In fact, my producer is in the audience, slightly disconcerting. They never leave you alone, your bosses. Uh, and, uh, but I'm also a trustee of Tate. So uh, I have some self-interest in what we're going to discuss tonight. And it really is some fascinating facts. But I also want to say th a huge thank you uh, to the audience uh, coming tonight, because I know all of you have uh, huge knowledge and expertise in this area. And we will be doing dread word, a Q&A after we finish our discussion here and inviting, hopefully, comments and questions from you, uh, the audience. But I want to start off, uh, obviously, with Anders, because it's your report. You published the first report uh, a year ago. This is a sort of half yearly update, and we're going to get half yearly updates from now on. This is an exclusive, because it's not going to be published fully until the 1st of November, about the state of the art market. And obviously, just setting the scene, what I hadn't appreciated till we started talking is that just 4% of artists make up about 75% of the value of art sold at auction of contemporary art. And, 800 and f there are about 800, it's an exclusive club, 850 artists that sell for a million dollar plus. So I think we're going to have a couple of slides to support your points, but tell us the state of the art market. Right, so maybe for some of you as already, as, as um, Anthony said, maybe was participating in the February event we had with the launch of the inaugural report. Um, so I thought maybe we'll take, it off, take us up to 2020, 2022, uh, end of 2022, and as you can see on the graph, well, on each side of me, um, we basically ended up uh, a year at, on a record high. So this is uh, a market we're looking purely at the one million plus, as, as mentioned already, uh, and very important market for, uh, a market that straddles, you know, basically the art as an historic cultural object as well as a financial, um, uh, I guess, an asset, um, which also links to what, what, what was said earlier on um, with, with, with Damien's introduction. Um, what is interesting, I think it's, we saw a sort of very, as you can see, like a kind of a V-shaped um, recovery in the market after the pandemic, obviously it's hit the art market hard. Um, if you had looked at the first report, which is available online and you can download that for free, um, you would also see that actually private sales, which is one of the unique aspects of this report, is that we are bringing in um, proprietary data from Sotheby's to provide a better and more reflective picture. Um, the auction data itself is from the three big auction houses, Sotheby's, Christie's, and Phillips. Um, but we're trying to augment and add more, I guess, uh, try to give a more holistic approach to the market by bringing in uh, private sales data and also, as we'll see later on, uh, bidder demographics to understand who's, who's behind these purchases, both in terms of ge geography as well as um, age groups. Um, so, obviously, if you look at this country, we had uh, first half of last year, interest rates were still at 1%. Um, and then obviously things started to turn for the worse. And we have had 15 consecutive uh, interest rate hikes. Um, the economy is tougher, the challenges are slower growth, higher inflation, higher interest rates. And I guess it's what we try to do is to kind of turn us, you know, how has that affected the art market, particularly for the 1 million plus segment? Even within this very high end of the market, there is clearly different trends taking place, both on the price segmentation level, but as well as we will see um, within the artists themselves. So here we have broken up the market in um, five segments, um, 1 million to 5 million, 5 million to 10 million, 10 to 20, and, and, and 20 above and above. Um, and what you can see is that the, the largest impact has been at the very, very top end of the market. I mean, basically 2022 was a record year for um, the 20 million plus market, and obviously on the back of a significant amount of single, single owner collections that appeared both in the first half and the second half. Now, people might say, well, is this a, you know, as price is falling? This is really much more of a supply issue, and I'm sure my, my uh, colleagues can probably, um, uh, you know, talk more about this, but it's, um, this is 
most people are in difficulties, you know, obviously in a, in a state of uncertainty that we have seen, particularly in the last six months, um, you know, collectors and consignors are probably more hesitant to put things onto the market. I mean, it's very interesting to see now coming into the autumn season, some very big collections are coming to the market this autumn, which I think unless there was confidence in the market, I think these collections probably will be held off for longer. So I think there's, a, there's these nuances here, even at the very top end of the market, where we might see a rebound in this next six months. But if we move further down, and if you can look at the actual, the, the, the dark blue line, which is represents the one to five million, you could see that virtually there's been no change between first half of 2022 and first half of 2023. If you go one step up, five to 10 million, you know, still significant value here, actually that market is up 18% in terms of sales. So we are, we are seeing that the, the one to 10 million has actually done really, really well um, and is, uh, is forming you know, in terms of lots and you know, over 80-90% of the market in terms of lots sold. And I think this is, this is the kind of, which looks like to be the kind of the core of the market at the moment. So therefore, breaking down this 30% <coughs> into finer slices, you will see that the actual, the, the market is, you know, it looking much more robust than it is. And it's gonna be interesting, obviously, going into this autumn to see whether that top end of the market will recover, uh, maybe not to the 22, 2022 levels because we had some exceptional collections coming which we might only see every decade, but I think we're gonna see a recovery in that part of it. Now, there's obviously other things we're gonna to touch on regarding generation, et cetera, but there's been some interesting findings also um, regarding changes and gradual changes in generational shifts in the market. For the first time, we've seen Gen X overtaking the baby boomers in terms of purchasing, um, oh, sorry, bidding act activity in the first half of uh, 2023. We're going, to, uh, we're going to talk, yeah, we're going to talk more in a, about in that a minute, because uh, obviously we've got a room full of uh, Gen Z. I can't imagine that interest rates have a massive impact on some of the people who buy art, but is there an impact in terms of people wanting either to hold on to art because it's a store of value in uncertain economic times, or hold on to their art because they know they're not going to, to put it crudely, get the best price? I think it's a mix of both, I and mean, I think from, from our point of view, when we we just have another report coming out um, later this year with the art and finance report with Deloitte. But um, again, some of the findings shows that there's an increasing amount of people holding art for store of value purposes. I think for, from an auction perspective, obviously this is auction data. Um, I think there's the reason why we don't maybe see the supply in the first half. It's, it's probably just people are hesitant to see, you know, how is this, how is this economic impact or how is it going to actually sort of pan out in the marketplace? I think there is, you know, it doesn't look like you know, nothing has fallen. It's like the bottom and fallen out of the market. I think it's still really solid. Yeah, um, exactly. I mean, otherwise I that's it what have... comes out of, when you go granular, that's what comes out of it. Simon, you were uh, nodding in approbation, as it were. This is what you're seeing in terms of the people you deal with. Yeah, I like what you said just about potential rebound. I mean, the fact is that the best of the works coming in the second half have yet to appear on the market. They're coming up in November in New York. We've got some fabulous selections on their traveling exhibition upstairs, which you'll see later. But I've just come back from the Hong Kong sales. It was reassuring to see trading happening. There was still, I, also, I think, um, I don't know if I'm jumping the gun on another topic, but we see that Chinese buyers, when I was out there, they were, they were considered the buyer base. And now they are sellers and buyers. So it speaks of a sort of maturity oh, that okay, they can yes. trade both They've got ways. collections right. they can now. And we're even thinking now about more strategically about going to source from Southeast Asia. Many of the, in my field, and precious modern works that have been bought over the past two decades could well come back to markets. Isabel, what are you seeing in terms of the people you deal with? And are you recognizing what Anders and Simon are talking about? Yeah, absolutely. I would also add that it's um, in these moments when people have to be really picky about what they spend their money on, they become um, really eager to find the best examples. Um, so there's a practicality involved, as you just said, but there's also um, a desire to continue to find the best objects that people can um, afford. So it's a very interesting time to talk to collectors because um, it's, it's not a race for who can pay the most. It's, it's really looking at what will fill gaps in collections, et cetera. And I, um, I enjoy this time. It becomes a very fruitful exercise to, um, 
to be so closely involved with what people really, really want and how discerning they have to be. Um, oh, that's interesting. So that in sort of slightly tougher times, people become much more focused yes. on what they really want to collect. Yes, because it's also less about um, racing for the top price. You need to buy smart. Um, and that, that means that there's a whole lot of different reflections that comes in. Um, the other thing that you touched upon as well is that obviously um, the last time we saw a market retracting a little bit, um, we had a different pool of buyers. So I'm talking about the contemporary um, buyers. We have gained an enormous amount of buyers since, and collectors since um, 2014, 15, 15 um, and those collectors, maybe there's sort of, for some of them, it's a little bit tougher to experience a retracting market for the first time. But equally, it creates a whole new um, pool of clients that, that we can dip in and out of. So not everybody will be uh, inactive at the same time. Uh, well, you've done a brilliant segue to our next topic, which is who are the new uh, buyers? How, is, how are the demographics uh, changing. We tried to refresh ourselves earlier about uh, baby boomers, Gen X, millennials, Gen Zs. And got goodness a bit confused. Knows, good, goodness knows what comes next. But uh, Anders, do you want to kick off and talk a bit about the changing nature of the art collector? Yeah, I mean, I think up till, for even if you start to look at, uh, if I start almost with the, the younger generation of the millennials, which are, uh, which you would think, you know, are they involved in this market? But it's interesting to look between particularly, well, if I look at the top 50 artists that we have selected for this report, so these are the, you know, the most sold artists um, over this period. Um, in 2018, millennials account for 6%. And in the first half of um, 2023, this year, they were almost 30%. Wow, that's huge. And that's a, this is a younger generation where we're starting to see from a, playing a very, I would say, a small role in the market to actually now playing a significant role. Um, now, the other thing we saw in the first half is how the Gen X, which is our generation, right? I'm afraid so. Yeah. Um, is, um, which are from 1985 to 2002, by the way. Sort of, no. <laughs> but, um, no. Um, the, so the thing with that particular generation uh, this year is basically that they have taken over the baby boomers. So baby boomers has been dominating this market for, well, for a very long time. And obviously what we're seeing in terms of collections is many of the baby boomer generation is now the collections coming back to the market, the post-war generation or the silent generation also. Um, so Gen X this year overtook the, the first half of this month, oh, sorry, this year, we had the Gen X overtaking the baby boomers. And I think that's a, whether that's a sort of a, um, an ongoing trend, uh, but I think it's a significant shift because it sort of, it plays into this whole new wealth transfer that we are seeing in, in, in the global wealth landscape as a whole. And I think it's now going to start to play into the auction market, both in terms of the supply that we are already starting to see, but also in terms of change in demand, taste potentially. Uh, yeah, I was very struck by what you said about the massive increase in millennials. I mean, Isabel, do you see in terms of who's walking through the door, who, who you're getting to know, who are starting to take their collecting seriously, a very different kind of customer, if I can use that word? Yes, it's broader. Again, um, you know, maybe w when I started, Anthony was um, um, giving away when that was. Um, you know, your typical collector would be kind of really getting into his, um, his peaks, so to speak, around the age of 60, maybe a little bit later when, you know, things in life are established and you can, you can start to maybe put your funds um, in, a, in a diversity of things. That's, that's, that's such a typical framework no longer exists. Um, in the contemporary market, we also offer um, access to much younger um, collectors in order to connect with artists that are their age. So we've now started to do the now sales and all of the works that were will be offered in the now sales, we're having one um, this Thursday, are uh, from post 2000. So oh, there okay. is a greater connection and, and and the that's younger what genera that new generation wants to collect. Not necessarily, but it, it really helps to plant seeds that um, you can you can find artists of your own generation on the wall, and then maybe from there you flow into other categories. But it's important to be able to have that um, also because when you think about it, 
that generation comes to art not necessarily in a traditional way. It might be through fashion, through music, yeah. through all these other medias. And then suddenly um, the, connect, the, the artist really speaks to them because the, the entrance point is not the same. And as they're more connected to the artist's lifestyle in a way. They sort of want also, to know the artist. Yeah. Yes, and they and they and they can yeah, because through the, through digital platforms and new media and all of these things, they're so close yeah. um, to the artist's lifestyle. So it, it's it's definitely a younger generation. They also have access to a lot more money oh. than previously um, through tech, tech, from d different sources. But of course, yes, the the transfer of wealth is what um, we were talking about earlier as well. So. They're more comfortable in spending um, at a younger age. And Simon, what are you seeing? Uh, you obviously well, got a particular specialist. It's an as well. older generation, actually. So impressions, modern and contemporary. So we see, I mean, as you know, there are more consignments coming in, which is very exciting too. But what I've seen actually working with Damien Leslie, who who introduced the talks, is that a lot of people now are asking about how they can use art as collateral to facilitate either more buying or to bridge whatever they have to do um, to sell or hold on to those works. Um, so that's been actually a proper shift. We've really sort of engaged with clients on that basis. This opened up um, something quite interesting because they are, of course, the generation that would be thinking about the future, the legacy, yeah. how people are going to inherit the works, the planning that goes into that and so forth, which is less frothy and exciting than, than the now and the contemporary. But um, we have... The, the client base is slightly older from Pressure Mom, but also there are people entering who are looking for blue chip. And I think about last year when things like the Giacometti, Linné, or they, they, people do want to have the trophy work and they are prepared and understand they have to step up, step up to the highest level to attain that. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, both. And just drilling down into the new collector, there's also a change, isn't there? in the demographic, not just in age, more women collectors, uh, more uh, collectors from diverse backgrounds. Do our stats show that? I mean, our data doesn't have an, on that granular level, um, but I mean, anecdotally, I would... Uh... Isabel, you see that? Yes, well, I mean, if you think about what we have in the building at the moment, we are showing the Emily Fisher Landau um, highlights and the Pauline Capitas highlights that we're going to be selling in Paris in two weeks' time. So there have been um, phenomenal female collectors through all times. But again, um, women have more access to their own money these days. Um, pay gaps are trying to be corrected. So there's a lot more confidence um, for women as well to build their own collections, to have their own taste. It doesn't necessarily need to be dictated um, through um, a male gaze. So we, we are seeing really interesting diversity versus um, 10, 15 years ago when the female collector was much rarer. Um, and it struck me actually just to add that uh, having just been in Hong Kong, there are significant numbers of um, women collectors in the greater China area, including from the mainland. So who, in who, Asia, that's particularly yeah. true. And, yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, and news. it struck me that I've totally forgotten that my mother wrote a book called Great Women Collectors, which I probably should have <laughs> you read should have... before I uh, asked. I'd love to read that. Yes, but <laughs> well, I'm going to bring you a copy tomorrow. Fantastic. Thank you. That? You're all witnessing this. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'll get you a signed, uh, I'll get you a signed copy. Uh, I think we've got two left on the shelves. So you can have one of them. Um, can, can we talk, you mentioned as well, in t talking about the kind of younger collector and the kind of digital. I mean, uh, what is change? Is, is you know... A Sotheby's auction is now an event, uh, just as a fashion show is an event. You know, you used to think I'm so exclusive being at the Burberry fashion show, but it's being live streamed. So everyone is now participating. It's kind of democratising things. Do websites, social media, live streams of auctions, do, are they bringing collectors to or uh, high net worths who, to buy art? Does that make an impact? I mean, I think the accessibility is what we've just seen is a total sea change, yeah. certainly from when Isabel and I joined together at the same time. I mean, the, it, it, the access that you can get through the technology that has been deployed in the auction industry and the arts generally is, is on another level. So all the, the, um, the live stream, the actual, well, actually to the build up to the auction, prior to the auction even happening, the marketing and press machines as they you know, sort of get underway, the means 
by which they do that, the outreach through social media and so forth is, is on another, and we get plenty of reaction from that. What was the TikTok statistic that we had from the Freddie Mercury sale? But um, that's just in the build up. Then there's the design element to the galleries. Um, people do want to engage with the object and come and see those things. We saw that with, I think, 150,000 visitors coming through our galleries, which is the highest we've ever had in the United Kingdom. I think what drove that was the Ed Vesey yeah, broadcast was. on Time Radio. Thank you for that. Yes, yes. Um, look, uh, I'm getting carried away with the discussion. I'm finding it yeah. so fascinating. I know we have to talk to our audience, but before we do that, we're going to have the Simon and Isabel show. We're going to drill down into a review of some of the upcoming highlights. And there we go. It's all working brilliantly. So Cecily Brown, um, so there aren't just more female collectors. Luckily, there are also a lot more female artists that we offer. And Cecily Brown is in our now sale. And I'm so excited to say that, generally speaking, and at least this time, yet again, in the now auction, we have as many female artists as we have male artists. So we're actually a parity, 50-50. Um, this painting, Tricky, from 2001, has an estimate of 1.2 to 1.8 million pounds. And um, it's a brilliant example of um, a sort of mid-size um, work by Cecily Brown. Her notoriety has increased massively over the last um, five to 10 years, but also her price points have moved um, so much that I think seven of the top 10 prices were achieved in the last three, three or five years. I, need to, I think it's five years. Um, but clearly a massive increase in her value in, um, in recent times. So we're... And those little bar charts are where people come from who bid for her work, is that right? Yeah, so that's the bidding, bidding activity um, in, in so the So it's market. mainly American. I see, how interesting. Um, right, Simon. So this Magritte is being sold in our Paris auction of Mod Modernité, La Valse Hésitation from 1955, 10 to 15 million euros. It's, it's about the iconic imagery. It's, it's, it's everything that you're looking for, Magritte, the clouds, the night and day, um, the, the, the confused and mysterious elements um, that draw the viewer in. Um, there's no tree from which these apples have dropped. There, what, what is the reason, what is the purpose of the masks um, uh, which have been attached and who has attached them to the apples, etc. He didn't want us to, he didn't give us a rhyme or reason, he didn't give us a um, uh, even the title doesn't actually um, relate to the painting. That's all the, the mystery of images that Magritte wanted to, to convey. But the apple is, uh, you know, it is a, um, a repeating motif in his work. And I think the appeal of surrealism continues to grow. Uh, it's extraordinary just in, um, you know, we scored the record price over 60 million pounds for a work by Magritte, which is actually also a sea change in Magritte prices. And we've seen, you know, increased... Um, participation for Magritte. I think that the imagery speaks across categories and also right up to contemporary collectors. Everyone would love to own something from this category. And I think surrealism itself is something that you can, sort of containable part of art history. You know all the players in it and the yeah. surrealist movement with its... Um, and it's also, I mean, it's instantly recognizable. Yeah. I would recognize that as a, as a Magritte. Um, right, this, very exciting, featured in Ed Vasey's newsletter last week. It's such a big deal. So, I, I mean, most people in the audience will, will know very well when they are confronted with this image why it is valued in excess of $120 million. It's just an extraordinary chromatic um, experience to stand in front of it. And in fact, you don't even need to get close. It, it speaks across a room. It, it speaks across... That's the, upstairs as well. And that's upstairs. And you can see then it's coming off view at the end of tomorrow. So, so today's the day. But it also is from 1932. And while Picasso was a master in every period, he worked. 1932 is considered to be one of the best years, best vintages for the artist. And um, in fact, we have two 1932 Picassos in the same cell. One was painted in February 1932, and the other, this one, in August, uh, 17th of August 1932. The interesting thing here is that the first painting, which we'll see also upstairs, is a sort of coded um, depiction of Marie Therese when his relationship with her was secret. Um, and then in the intervening time, he had an exhibition at the Gallery Georges Petit, and um, Marie Therese stepped out into the open. And so by the time he painted this beautiful work, um, and actually the montre, the, the uh, wristwatch she has, is sort of reference to the time that they had to keep their relationship um, a secret. But here, they've stepped out together, and it's just an extraordinary 
picture. Does the other Picasso have a similar estimate? Uh, that's a very good point because the value equation will be of interest to this audience. So the still life, which used to belong to Douglas Cooper and Billy McCarty Cooper, um, was um, is, is around twenty-five million dollars, and this is one hundred and twenty. So only four Picasso paintings have uh, achieved prices in excess of one hundred million dollars. This is one of them, and it will be selling for around that price minimum. Is it Oliver Barker doing the auction? I think he. No, yeah, I think he is. Is he feeling the yeah. pressure? He's feeling the pressure. Um, if you've read your Ed Vasey newsletter, Simon, you'll know what is special about that watch. Can you tell me, please? Yes. I didn't read There are only three Picasso paintings. With, with what? Okay, I thought you were going to ask me. I thought you were going to ask me what watch it is. I, I definitely don't know the answer. Uh, uh, right, let's look at the last one. So this um, painting called Sunflowers by Joan Mitchell is not in the building. I can't wait to see it myself, but it's coming up in our New York November auction. It's incredibly exciting because it is already set to um, recalibre the uh, record price of says, um, Joan Mitchell at auction, which is currently just above 16 million. And so boldly, um, the estimate here has been placed at in excess of 20 million. Um, I think even from, from this picture on the screen, one can understand why. And um, interestingly, I was looking at the top 50 artists in your report. So Joan Mitchell is the first female artist to appear on level 17. Um, maybe she can... Um, Climb. climb up a bit after this after this auction. Yes, it'll be very interesting as this report gets, um, uh, you know, a, a, a history uh, to see the changing uh, numbers for different artists <laughs> where they are in the we have an up down cursor. Uh, where so they position last point. year, up three in, places. A nice Joe little addition for the newsletter, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're going to devote. I'm going to devote most of my life to this newsletter now, <laughs> on various different media. Do regional ec economic situations affect the market when you look at your statistics overall and you break them down regionally can you say well actually uh in you know europe at that point the economy was not doing as well as it is was in other places yeah, I and mean, this is i think it's really interesting about the data we have which through this partnership with solvis is to get access to the actual um buyer or bidder dem demographics because this is where you could see both on the overall market level, but also on the artist level, is you know how diversified, how broad is the collector base, and I think there's no doubt that economic situations in different countries will have an impact on confidence, uh, you know, economic confidence or the willingness to spend. And I think the artists that are either you know exposed to only one particular region or one uh, you know will ultimately be maybe potentially more exposed to a downturn in that part. But I, mean, I think it's interesting to see the top 50 artists, many of them are really having a, uh, a broad European, North American and Asian presence. Um, and it's interesting to see that Asian presence overall is about 30% and some artists less, some artists almost exclusively Asian presence. And I think in those cases there might be a downturn in a certain market might be more susceptible, um, you know, have a more a bigger impact on, on that particular artist. So there's definitely an economic, but I think also, as you mentioned earlier, I don't think this is, we're, we're largely in a market where uh, it's a certain demographic that is not completely, you know, going to be one-to-one -one because of interest rate going up. I mean, this is a, it's a, it's, it's a, a wealth bracket which can stand what most people are, would suffer at the moment. Because the other question I'm interested in is the, uh, Isabel referred to the two great collections that are coming up for auction. Um, when a great collection comes on the market, that presumably does, distort is perhaps the wrong word to use, but uh, you might, for example, be talk, say in three years time, we could be here talking about the art market is down 20%, but that's because no great collection has come to the market that year. And this is very much, I think, the situation right now is um, is the supply side, and you only need you know 100 million Picasso coming to the market. If it's not there, then suddenly it's a 100 million gap. Um, so this is why I think it's important to actually you know to really uh, drill down into the data to show that there is different ways of looking at it, um, and uh, as you say, um, it's very susceptible to big collections coming up, changing the entire optics of the market, um, which is often not very well understood by uh, 
people observing it, but partly because it, there's no room to kind of understand it and or drill it down. Uh, good. Well, look, um, the room is getting slightly hotter and the champagne is getting colder. So I'm going to, uh, I just want to ask the last question uh, as the chair of this panel. Uh, as a trustee of Tate, obviously, I'm very interested in the impact that museum shows have on uh, this art market. I mean, we've got Sarah Lucas at the moment at Tate Britain. We've got Philip Guston. We've got uh, Marina Bromwich at the Royal Academy. We've got Franz Howes talking about old masters at uh, the National. Uh, does a blockbuster show move the market, Isabel? Yes and no. A good answer. <laughs> Go straight into politics. <laughs> <laughs> Elaborate. It, it, it can do. Obviously, I was thinking earlier of Cecily Brown. You know, when you get to um, see Cecily's work in the Met, um, clearly that is not only a phenomenal experience, but it also really helps to understand all her references, where she's coming from. It gives a new lecture of the work. So um, there's a greater understanding. And, and as you said, you know, there's a demand for data, for information, for storytelling, for all of these things. So it can definitely help. Um, it, it doesn't always um, generate a, a new lecture, or at least not a new lecture from a value point of view. Sometimes um, that takes a little bit longer. Um, so I don't think you can, maybe you can, but I can't, make a direct connection to that necessarily all the time. It is certainly important, but the effect of it on the market is difficult to predict. Great. Well, look, Isabel, I think it's important that you have the last word. So I'm going to end... Uh, end everything there. I want to say a huge thank you to Isabel Pagman and to Simon Stock from Sotheby's, from Anders Pedersen from Art Tactic, who's going to completely revamp his report thanks to the uh, audience interactive feedback and to Anthony Kalnett from Sotheby's and Damien Lesby's, Leslie from Sotheby's Financial Services. Uh, please do go and see in person some of the incredible works of art that were on the slideshow uh, and enjoy a drink and a gossip. Thank you very much for coming.